Warning. Hey everyone. Although it doesn't come in till the third act, there is some strong language in today's episode, including a couple of F-bombs. I've not beeped anything out, so I thought I should let you know about it beforehand. Let's get to the show. Hello everybody, I'm Pete Brown, and this is my podcast, Pete Brown Says. You know, back in the mid-1990s, I was in the Peace Corps, and I lived in southern Russia, about 800 miles south of Moscow, and I learned Russian, and I spoke it pretty well. But even after two years of being fully immersed in the language, there were still times that I would be reaching for a word that I knew in English that I couldn't find in Russian. One time I had to call on the landline telephone one of the other Peace Corps volunteers in my city, and he lived with a Russian family, and the grandmother, the babushka, answered the phone. And she told me that he wasn't there, and I asked if she could have him call me back. And she said, no, you just call back some other time. And then I tried to say, well, it's very important that he call me back. And I could not, for the life of me, remember the Russian word for important. So I said, at the ochin importante. I just made it up, right? And hoped that it worked. And she seemed kind of confused, and I knew I didn't have the right language there. Actually, I should have said, etin ochin vajna, ochin vajna. I've been thinking a lot about made-up words lately, and they are what today's main story is about. But before we get to it, I had a quick sit-down with my wife, who teaches English as a second language at the local high school, about a made-up word that wound its way into her students' vocabulary. Let's give a listen. So joining me at the top of this episode is my wife, Jody. Hi. Hi. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Good. Okay, and you got your water, and, and you had me change the stool out for a soft chair. Correct. Okay, you're in your PJs. I am. It's okay. my new robe. So this is the end of your first full year of teaching high school. That's right. And what do you teach? I teach English as a second language. Okay, and where are your students from? They're from all over the world. There's four places primarily that the students in my high school come from. They come from Nepal, from Central and South America, from Arabic-speaking countries, and from Somalia. Okay, and you teach uh, English at all levels to them, so... Yes, ninth, ninth through 12th grade, emergent through the highest ESL level, which are students who are getting ready to enter mainstream English classes. They're about to leave the ESL yeah. program. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. So a couple of months ago, uh, you came to me and you said, hey, could you finish this sentence? And what was the sentence you wanted me to finish? Hush your. And I said, magusher. Hush your magusher, right? And mm-hmm. then you said... What did you ask me about that? I said, I remember this differently. Okay. Tell me how you remember it. I... It's important to get the wrong way down. Go ahead. I remember I was sitting at the purple table looking it up online because I had taught this to my class and I was trying to figure out where in the world did this idiom come from? And you walked through the room and said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, I'm trying to figure out this idiom. I taught this to my students. I don't know where it came from. I don't know what it means. Have you ever heard of hush your magusher? And you said, yes, I have. And I said, oh, thank God. No one else I've talked to about it has ever heard of it. Where is it from? And you said, I made it up. I made it up, yeah. And I said, what? Well, let's talk first of all about how how this came to be taught to your students. Well, it came up in class because I had 14 emergent students from like five different countries who would not stop talking to each other in every language but English. They were the most hilarious group of kids who wanted to do everything with each other besides speak English. And finally, I just said, okay, you guys, hush your magushers. And for the first time all year, they became absolutely still and silent and looked around at each other and said, Oh, hush your mergusher. And they instantly seized on this phrase and started telling each other to hush their magushers. And I thought, oh my God, I finally taught them something. I was so pleased with myself. And I said, ah, yes, this is an um, American idiom. It means to be quiet. And they... They wrote it down. They wrote, oh, they wrote it down. Then as soon as anybody started talking out of turn that day, they told each other to hush their magushers. And so this comes from uh, when the kids were babies, actually, mm-hmm. is when I started when, saying, From our kids were yes, babies. that's not right. Not from when the ESL we kids, kids were babies. kids, that's right. And uh, when the babies were crying, you used to say, shoo, shoo, bug. 
to yes. them, right? And mm-hmm. uh, when I would hold them and try and, and quiet them, I'd go, hush, hush, hush your magusher. Sounds great. It should be an idiom. So I told you I made it up. <laughs> so you had <laughs> Well, to go. as soon as you said that yeah. and said, yeah, I used to say hush your magusher, then I remembered. Yeah. And so then uh, you had to go back to your class and what did you tell them? I had to explain to them that, in fact, Husher McGusher was not an idiom. It was not anything anyone they would ever meet outside of our classroom, besides you, would ever say. And that it was something that was only from my family, that we had made up as a family. And they were shocked, because <laughs> they were really enjoying going around saying Husher McGusher. And then I said, but you can feel free to say it. And if you say it, you will just be an honorary member of the Brown family. And so they continued to say it. And we just adopted it as a fun thing in our class that we didn't said. And it just continued to be a part of our our class culture. Great. So you recorded a bunch for us. We're going to listen to those now. Sounds good. Hey, Pete. Husher McGusher. Yeah, Husher McGusher. You Husher McGusher. No, you Husher McGusher. Husher McGusher. Those are great. In many cases, made up words grow from a child's misunderstanding, and they stick around because they're adorable or they're easy to remember, like they're totes adorbs. When my daughter was in kindergarten, she referred to a Haida bed as a Honda bed. And we still say this in my family to this day. You don't want to sleep on the Honda bed, by the way. There's an awful bar right in the middle. Today I want to tell you the story of another made-up word in my family, one that comes from my own childhood. I was in kindergarten when my family moved from one suburb to the next suburb over. And to ease this transition, I suppose, My mom had my room painted blue, and then she went to the local Hallmark store and bought and hung a series of posters featuring members of the Peanuts gang. There was Snoopy wearing sunglasses with the words, Joe Cool, across his sweatshirt. Linus and his blanket sat under the quote, Happiness is a warm blanket, which always confused me a bit, to be honest, because, you know, the the way Linus holds his blanket makes it seem like it's more for anxiety than it is for warmth. But the poster that I remember in the most detail The one I laid in bed and looked at and thought about almost every morning was a profile of Charlie Brown laying in his bed, his covers pulled up around his head. The poster is keyed in dark purples and blues. They're the little lines Charles Schultz would use to indicate stress or upset in one of his Peanuts characters. Charlie Brown stares blankly out of the frame. Above him is written the phrase, thought for the day, go back to bed and hope tomorrow will be better. You know, with this poster, I mean, as an adult, I've just, I've always wondered, like, the fuck, Hallmark? That's the message you want kids to see? Go back to bed? Jesus. I'm always perplexed by my memory of this poster when it surfaces, and it does surface more often than I'd like to admit. It's a perfect example of when a product is ostensibly made for kids, but it's actually written for adults. Adults who might have the context and the fullness of time to shake their heads knowingly and think, oh yeah, I've been there, Charlie Brown. I've been there. But when you're six, when you're six, you struggle with what Charlie Brown is suggesting here. Stay in bed for a whole day? What? What? Why? What's going on, Chuck? But then, but then you go to school and you ride 45 minutes on a school bus twice a day. This in the era before getting all upset about bullying was a thing. The atomic wedgie era when your underpants could be yanked so hard that the band tears off. And when you try to escape, try to make some space between you and those who've inexplicably chosen to torment you by swinging your evil Knievel lunchbox in wild arcs, only to see it kicked out of your hands, the lid dent and break off, and the thermos inside fall and scatter across the floor. The age when kids would gang up and pin your arms to your back and force your head into a toilet and flush it while gleefully calling out, Swirly, swirly, swirly. And what can you do? Nothing more than endure this. Endure this and wonder why your teacher never bothers to ask a single question about why you've returned to class from the bathroom soaking wet. You have a few of those days quite early in your life. You experience that fullness of time. You find yourself in grade three wearied 
with stress marks around your eye. And you lay in bed and you look at this poster that some fuckers at Hallmark thought would even be remotely appropriate for kids to hang on their walls. And you think, you think, I get it now, Chuck. I get it. This life sure seems for shit sometimes. I think back to my room and this poster often. I've spent years of my adult life fending off depression, seeing an army of therapists just to keep myself going. And it's alarming, truly alarming, how often I find myself laying in my bed, thinking about my Charlie Brown poster, thinking of the miles and miles and hours and hours between this day and that, marveling at how a world of travels and 15,000 days can pass. And you still find yourself back here, where you started trying to deny the truth of this day's thought. Go back to bed and hope tomorrow will be better. I feel now that I should point out that like many kids of my time, I loved peanuts. I read the comics every morning in the plain dealer while I ate bowl after bowl of Cheerios and girded myself for the bus ride. My parents bought me collections of the comics for birthdays, and in our family we watched every Charlie Brown holiday special there was. Which is all to say that while Chuck and I had a shared understanding about the shittiness of the world, we also both enjoyed the heck out of Snoopy's antics, marveled at Schroeder's piano playing, and thought seriously about dropping a nickel in Lucy's can for some much needed psychiatric advice. And I think it's because I studied those posters in my room that one day in art class, when we were given a large sheet of newsprint to make our own poster, that I started drawing peanuts. And though constrained by my third grade level skills, I had somehow managed to produce a fairly accurate recreation of Snoopy sitting with Woodstock atop his doghouse. Somehow I had absorbed the tiny details of each character, the inset of Snoopy's ear, for example, and the confusion of Woodstock's feet kids at my table looked over and said, hey, that's pretty good. And I, having never really received positive praise from my peers, I didn't know what to say. So I said, I know. And I kept drawing. Next to the doghouse, I drew Charlie Brown holding a sign, a square of poster board tacked to a stick. The Peanuts gang could often be found in the comic strips, picketing around their neighborhood, holding up signs like, welcome great pumpkin, or today is Beethoven's birthday. I suppose that this was a way for the characters to create some agency for themselves, making a sign, tacking it to a stick, and wandering the streets, as if to declare, this is who I am, this is what I'm all about. Which is probably why I drew Charlie Brown, whom I honestly don't remember doing any picketing in the comic strip itself, holding up a sign, and why I wrote on that sign, be nice to Charlie Brown Day. Because I think I wanted Chuck to do something about his predicament. I wanted him to declare that he was worthy of decent treatment. To give him a reason to get out of that damn bed. Because he was pretty sure that today, be nice to Charlie Brown Day, would be okay. My poster then received the very highest honor a grade school artwork can receive. The teacher laminated it. Lamination. Lamination. To forever seal your document inside two heat-pressed sheets of clear plastic, giving it a much better chance of making it home untorn and onto its rightful place of honor on the family refrigerator. Which is where I put my poster when I got it home. I should mention here that my parents were not very big artwork on the fridge types. My dad was of the opinion that only honest and direct feedback was of value when it came to his son's artwork. I remember showing him once a drawing I made of a purple helicopter hovering over a waterfall, and he said, This picture's a fake. The only detail is the helicopter, and it's not drawn very well. I think that was the last thing I had ever shown him. So you can imagine that I was feeling pretty confident about my laminated poster if I brought it home and put it up on the fridge by myself. Agency. Check that out, Dad. It's laminated, bitch. At dinner that evening, I waited for someone to remark on the awesome Peanuts poster that now graced the fridge, and when they didn't, I finally asked if they had seen my poster. After a pause, my dad asked, What's Benicito? What? Benicito, my mom said. Why is Charlie Brown saying Benicito? And slowly it dawned on me that my handwriting, oh my handwriting, always terrible, always challenging, to this day, awful. My handwriting and the available space on Charlie Brown's poster had led me to write, be nice too, with no discernible spaces between the words. And my parents were reading it as one word, 
Benicito, and I remember feeling so defeated by this that I just stared straight down at the pork chop on my plate while my mom worked to make this all seem funny. We thought you're learning Italian, she said. Benicito, Benicito. And then, come on, you know we're only teasing you. Benicito, Benicito. She said this bit about teasing to me quite a lot when I was growing up. But the truth is, I've never done well with being teased, particularly by my family, no matter how minor the joke may be. It's as if my ability to roll with teasing was flushed down that toilet years before, along with my dignity and my ability to laugh at myself. Swirly, swirly, swirly. I took the poster off the fridge when I did the dishes that night. I do not know whatever became of it. I do know what became of Benicito, however. It followed me as I grew up, hung out in the back of my brain, and when I had kids, I taught it to them. When you're raising kids, I found it's handy to have one word that gently reminds someone to be kind to others. My daughter, as I write this, is in middle school, and she has some teachers who, quote, hate our whole class, unquote, and, quote, give us ten times as much homework as all the other kids, unquote. And I'll listen to her vent with as much empathy as I can muster, which admittedly is never enough. But if her complaining crosses a line, if it gets personal about a teacher or another student, I'll softly rejoin, hey now, Benicito, okay? Benicito. And my kids know that this means be nice to someone. Because the truth of the world is that sometimes life can be for shit, but we don't have the luxury of going back to bed and hoping for a better tomorrow. For whatever little and tiny bit it's worth in this sometimes shitty world, Benicito, I say. Benicito. That story, I have to say, got a little bit darker than I thought it would. Sometimes when you dig up your memories, you find they're still wrapped in all the feelings you had when you tried to bury them. And sooner or later, you gotta decide what to do with them. I had thought about adding a funnier, lighter story about grade school to balance out this episode, but I've since decided to let this one end here, which is where I am, writing this moment in a coffee shop, imagining my daughter, who in general does not want to be mentioned in the things that I write, giving me a load of grief over this episode. I'll listen closely and nod. And when she's done, I'll tell her to hush. Hush your McGusher. Shh. Pete Brown Says is the property of Blue Monkey Communications and is a work of creative nonfiction audio written and produced by me, Pete Brown. This show is written to the very best of my memory. And while I like to think my memory is better than average, I should also acknowledge that it's been 30 or more years since many of these stories have taken place. And as any cognitive neurologist will tell you, it's all but certain my memory has futzed with these narratives during that time. But this is honestly how I remember these things, and that's what I'm sharing in this show, my memory of them. If you like the show, can I ask you to take five minutes and leave a review on iTunes? More than anything else you can do, this will really help get these stories in front of more people. If online reviews aren't your thing, maybe just tell a friend or two that there's this quirky new podcast that they should check out. You can read an essay version of today's main story at PeteBrownSays.com, where I also put a featured image for each show, usually something that was in the episode itself. The written essays usually have some additional materials and content that was cut from the audio production, as well as links to other things mentioned in the show. There's also a Patreon link at PeteBrownSays.com, so if you'd like to kick in a few dollars to help offset the production and hosting costs, I'd super appreciate it. Finally, you can follow the show on Facebook at Facebook.com backslash PeteBrownSays, on Instagram and Twitter at PeteBrownSays, and also over on Medium at Medium.com slash PeteBrownSays. Music in this show comes from a variety of sources. The opening and interstitial music is by Brian Hake. Additional interstitials are by Kevin Davison. And the closing song, I'm Not Myself, is by Brian Hake and Kevin Davison, as performed by their now defunct band, Delicious. Additional background tracks and sound effects come from the websites audionautics.com, the YouTube free music library, and freesound.org, and are licensed under Creative Commons. Please see the show notes on PeteBrownSays.com for complete attributions. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, good times, everybody. Good times. Yeah.
uh, there was a girl in our dorm sophomore year, not in our dorm, but she was a girl that lived on South Green that I had a crush on. And for some reason, he always remembered that the four digits of her phone number spelled out poop. 